Hey, so you're after some analysis of William Blake's London, and that's awesome, and you have come to the right place, I promise you that. However, as you can see by the video's title, and also that, you can see that I've already analysed half of the poem. So why not watch that bit first, and then come back to this video? And without any further ado, here is part two. So this is where part one of my London analysis finished. There were only three questions for you to look at, think about, consider, and I hope you have had time to do that. I'm going to pass over in just a moment to a version of me in the video, and then when the video resumes, I will go over some possible answers and interpretations and responses to those questions. So, Liam, over to you. Looking at the second line of this stanza, there are two words that have double meanings. We need to think about those meanings in order to make sense of this line. So blackening can just mean turning black, probably as a result of the smoke and fog of the Industrial Revolution. However, it can also suggest corruption. Appalls also has two meanings. To appall someone is to shock and disgust them. Appalls can also mean to turn pale. So thinking about those words, what could this line mean? we're going to think about a combination of each of these definitions. So if we look at the first possible meaning of each, the line reads that the church's walls are turning black, which shocks and disgusts people. Now this is quite a sympathetic reading of the line, as it's critical of the Industrial Revolution for ruining the church's beauty, rather than criticising the church for anything. The second meaning for each word suggests that the corrupt church is turning pale. That could mean that the church is guilty of something, perhaps not looking after the people in London who require it, but that it's trying to cover it up, it's trying to look pure, when really it's far from it. The first meaning of blackening and the second meaning of appalls says that the church's walls are turned black, and then paler. That could suggest that the church is overcoming the pollution, or that it is looking after itself and its appearance, perhaps at the cost of its people. And the second meaning of blackening and the first meaning of appalls creates yet again another meaning. It suggests that the church is corrupt and wicked, perhaps because it's not helping people, which shocks and disgusts the poem's persona. So I'm not entirely sure which reading of this line I agree with most, although I feel that one that is criticising the church is perhaps the one that is most fitting. Being an English dissenter, Blake was critical of the church as it was being meddled with by the state. Blake routinely criticises the state, i.e. the people in charge, and the impact that this meddling is having on people in the poem. And so something that is criticising the church seems right to me. So the blood, presumably of the English people, is running down the palace walls, much like how the phrase blood on your hands suggests that you are guilty of something. This line suggests that the monarchy, the people living behind those bloodied walls, is responsible for the misery and general negative impact that it is having on its people. Blake has placed the monarchy in the role of the enemy in this line, which might reflect his initial support of the French Revolution. Both the church and the monarchy have been blamed in this stanza. Together, these two entities represent the state, the ruling classes. Blake is rejecting authority and control, which is something we can see in his life through his religious and political beliefs. And now to the final quatrain. 
There are one, two, three, four questions for this one, three for imagery and one for language. Once we've looked at this last quatrain, we are going to consider the structure of the whole poem. So make sure that you're keeping some space for those notes. And now is your chance to pause the video and to make your annotations if you want to. The phrase youthful harlot contains juxtaposition as youthful has connotations of purity and innocence, whereas harlot means a prostitute and so therefore has connotations of sordidness and depravity and certainly a lack of innocence. Through using this juxtaposition, Blake is highlighting how London can corrupt anything. His criticism of it has moved from London's overwhelming control to its overall seediness and filth. London's corruption, as represented by the curse of the youthful harlots, which could mean either them swearing or that having them generally is a curse, is infecting babies. The babies are crying perhaps because that's just what babies do, or perhaps because they somehow know what their London life has in store for them. London's corruption is inevitable and inescapable. It will remain with them for their entire lives. Blake is clearly criticising the capital city. Blights and plagues are words that we associate with illness and disease. Blake uses these metaphorically to suggest that London will corrupt many people and that it is incurable. This is the final line of the poem and in it, Blake is creating a sense of inevitability. London will continue to control and corrupt. Marriage hearse is an oxymoronic image. As we associate marriage with both a fresh start and new life, whereas we associate hearses with death. If London is able to corrupt marriage, which should be sacred and pure and wholesome, then it could be able to corrupt and destroy anything. It is also worth considering that the images of the final line could relate back to the youthful harlots and that it is sexually transmitted diseases that are being discussed. STDs could plague marriages if a partner isn't faithful, which could in turn bring death to the marriage. As promised, I was going to discuss the whole poem's structure, and here are the two points that I'd like to consider. Now's your chance to pause the video if you want to make your own annotations. This is one of those poems where form mirrors content wonderfully. Here we have a poem that is concerned with power and control, and here we also have a poem that is incredibly rigid in its structure. Each of the four four-line stanzas, which is that quatrain I've mentioned so much in this video, follow the same ABAB rhyme scheme, which you could also call alternate rhyme. The rhymes in these stanzas are very strong and are full rhymes. There's no escaping this rhyme scheme. It is very, very controlled. Iambic tetrameter is the rhythm that is used throughout this poem. Iambic tetrameter is what we call lines that are eight syllables long and have four lots of dedum in them. However, a number of the poem's lines are a syllable short and are therefore rhythmically weak. This could show that too much control results in weakness. In this case, the state's over control of its people leaves them weak and sad. It's interesting that the stanza that is the most rhythmically weak is the third stanza, the one in which Blake discusses the root of the control and weakness. Whereas the only stanza that is totally strong is the second one, which is focused solely on the people of London. So maybe Blake is trying to give some sort of hint or indication that 
they do have strength after all. This poem takes the form of a dramatic monologue, which is where a first person persona speaks at length. Additionally, a dramatic monologue features a persona that watches or observes only and does not take an active role in the poem. In that case, it means that even the persona of this poem is powerless. They can't do anything to change London. They can only watch how terrible it is all around them. So that's the poem analysed in depth. And now we're going to consider the three M's of this poem. If that means nothing to you, I recommend that you have a quick look at the second video in this series, which is the second part for Simon Armitage's The Manhunt. And if I've worked YouTube correctly, or if I've remembered to, a link for that video should appear on screen up there, top corner. And so there's my overall summary of the poem. I've said that whilst walking around London during the Industrial Revolution, a persona sees misery, weakness and corruption everywhere they look. The church and the monarchy, also known as those with power, are to blame. They don't really seem to be doing anything about it. And there are my comments on the poem's mood. Simply put, I've said that there is a sense of inevitability throughout the poem and also a critical edge or critical tone. You can see I've used quotations there to back up my points too. And finally, there's my ideas about Blake's motivation. I've tried to squeeze in numerous examples of evaluative verbs and pieces of context. I want to know what you think though. What was the point of him putting down London like this? Was he just having a moan? Or do you think he had some sort of deeper purpose? Let me know in the comments section down below. Here we have a theme table. Again, I explained this in my second video of this series. That's the second part for Simon Armitage's The Manhunt. In short, I think you might find it useful to produce a large table for these themes with a row for each 18 anthology poems. Thinking about themes, that is what I would have done if I was completing the table for this poem. I think this poem really clearly relates to the theme of power, in this case the power of the ruling classes and the powerlessness of the people below them. Although Blake is a romantic poet, I don't think this poem is really too heavily concerned with nature, aside from the initial reference to the Thames. Although there are a few references to love, I don't think this is really a love poem. You would maybe be able to write an interesting essay about the corruption of love, but I don't think there's necessarily enough in there. This poem isn't about war, but you could argue that this poem is a critique of London during the Industrial Revolution, and so that's why I've ticked the time box. It's about a specific time. Last time I checked, London was a place, and therefore I've ticked it. This poem is about mankind, people, and the effect that a place can have on them. I have ticked death in this case which might seem odd, as nobody actually dies in this poem. However, I think you could write a very interesting essay about how this poem is about the metaphorical death of the individual. This poem can be said to be about religion in the sense that Blake seems to attack or at least blame organised religion. I would say though that it might be difficult to get a whole essay about religion out of this poem as there may not be enough quotations. So what do you think? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Whatever it is, please let me know in the comments section down below. To help you think about comparing poems, I reckon it would be useful for you to produce some sort of scale as I've suggested on the slide. If one is 
most negative and 10 is most positive. You could use this to put all of the place poems on. Don't just write the names of the poems though. Back up why you've put them, where you've put them. A bit of explanation, including some context and definitely at least one quotation will help you out there. In fact, it could look something like this. As you can see, I've given the name of the poem and poet and a score out of 10. I've given an explanation using a bit of context and I've even used a short quotation. Once you've studied or revised all of the anthology poems, then you'll be able to complete this, which I hope is something that you'll find useful, something that will help you think about comparing poems, comparing viewpoints. And that is another poem done. Cheers for watching. Uh, I really do hope that you've got something out of this. If this video has helped you in any way, then please do give it a like and subscribe to my channel and then turn on that notification bell too. If I've helped you with this poem, then there's another 17 anthology poems that I'll be able to help you with too. And that's before I've covered any of the other lit texts. Do drop a comment on the video too. You're welcome to add in any of your own bits of analysis or to ask me any questions that you might have about this poem. Adding a comment also helps with the YouTube algorithms. So if this video has helped you, then you can help me to help even more people by liking, commenting, etc. So it'll be recommended to even more people. Have an awesome rest of the day. And remember to take frequent breaks as you revise. A burned out student is not a happy or successful student. So what did William Blake think about London? Well, like most people and their hometowns, he thought it sucked.